to the book of Ezekiel. Some of you are like, I thought that was bread. No, it is a book in the Bible, Ezekiel chapter 47. In my Bible, it's on page 995, but I have a different Bible than you do. You know, that's not how it works. Well, I want to I talk to you today about one of my least favorite places in the whole wide world. Maybe you have your own place that you're like, I hate that place. For me, it has to be the Dead Sea in Israel. I know, you're thinking, what? Like, I've heard so many great things about it. You can float on the water. Um, well, I, I, let me give you a couple of reasons why I really did not like my experience there. Number one, it's incredibly hot. It is so hot. It is, it is actually the lowest point on earth that you can stand that is exposed. The lowest point on earth. And so it is incredibly hot. And I do not do well in hot. Amen? It is also, the, the Dead Sea is extremely salty, and therefore it has no life. There's no fish in this, in, this, in this lake, okay? And it's 10 times saltier than the ocean. Imagine getting that in your mouth. That is not fun or in your eyes. So I was like, take a picture. I opened my eyes. They're burning. My eyes are burning. And you go to wipe it, and you get, oh, it's just terrible. Don't do it. Number, number 10, it's muggy. It's muggy and yucky, and plus you have to pay to get into the water. It's really hard to access the shore without having to pay like $40. It's, just don't do it, okay? <laughs> Lastly, number 20, did I mention it was hot? It is hot. At the very same time, there's a little place just up, up the road in the Dead Sea called En Gedi, and it's going to be mentioned in our scripture today. It's actually mentioned in the Bible six times, En Gedi. And it's described as a place of lush beauty and abundance. The Song of Solomon compares it to his lover. Like, you are like the clusters of henna. Yeah, I won't go there. That's for the married folks, okay? This is one of my favorite places in the whole wide world, all at the same time. Um, and it is what you would imagine a true oasis to be like. In the middle of this deadness, you find the most modest stream of water that begins to, to, to bring greenery and life wherever it touches. And, and you can bathe in these waters. On my Instagram, I have a video of me bathing. You may not want to see that. Um, but I went in those waters, and in the middle of this hot, muggy mess, there was this refreshing spring of water that brought life to everything that it touched. And in Ezekiel 47, our main text for today, it imagines a day when a river will flow from the temple of Jerusalem to En Gedi, and then it will pour into the Dead Sea and make it come alive again. A river that will transform everything that it touches and one day, I think I will love the Dead Sea. Today's just not the day. Amen? So as we go to chapter 47, let's open up in a word of prayer. Lord, would you open up our minds as we engage in this prophetic word that you gave to the prophet Ezekiel while living in um, Babylon under captivity. You gave the people of God a vision of a future day where you would restore all things. So open our ears to hear and our eyes to see what you have for us today. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. And so today we're gonna look at this prophetic text in Ezekiel 47 as we explore the last aspect of what it looks like to build for the future. The prophecy describes a river flowing from the temple of God and it goes down, 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 down to the lowest point on earth called the Dead Sea. And what we're going to explore is one of the characteristics that makes light and life so unique among American churches. Not, I'm not saying we're the best church. There's only one church. Amen? Amen. But what makes us so unique is that we are a river church that sends people down a river. And we, we are a river church that flows into the deadest, driest, lowest places on earth until we see the river of God flow into every community that doesn't have the gospel. You see, our church was built to flow. And, and in, in order for our church to flow like a river and bring life wherever we go, we need to remain laser focused on two things, 
disciple making and church planting. And Ezekiel 47 gives us a vision for both. So let's go and read it. It says this in verse 1, Ezekiel chapter 47. The man brought me back to the entrance to the temple. And I saw water coming from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. Now, if you are a plumber, you're like thinking, what is going? This is a big problem. But this is not a problem in this vision. It says, for the temple faced east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. He then brought me out through the north gate and led me around the outside to the outer gate facing east. And the water was trickling from the south side. Now, this person that's leading Ezekiel in a vision is described as a man that looked like bronze who held a measuring rod and a cord. And so this is either an angel or the angel of the Lord, some kind of messenger that's not of this world. And he's leading Ezekiel in a series of visions. And this is one of the last visions. Let's continue in verse 3. As the man went eastward... With a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits and then led me through water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to the waist. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in a river that no one could cross. He asked me, son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on Each side of the river. He said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah, where it enters the Dead Sea. When it empties into the sea, the salty water becomes fresh. Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows... Everything will live. Fishermen will stand along the shore. From En Gedi to En Eglim, there will be places for spreading nets. The fish will be of many kinds, like the fish of the Mediterranean Sea. This is a vision given to Ezekiel and preserved for you and I today. You see, the prophet Ezekiel, he lived 2,600 years ago. Y'all know that's a long time, right? That's a long time. That's in B.C. times. And it was a terrible time to be alive and especially to be a, a, a part of the people of God. Why? Because they were sinning so grievously against the Lord that God had them crushed under the Babylonians and deported outside of their country. And so all these Jews were deported by the tens of thousands off and carted off to far away lands. And so it was a terrible time. And so God, God uses prophetic visions that both cast judgment on his people, but also gives them hope. And this is a vision of hope and restoration. God gave the people hope through the prophet Ezekiel that one day there would be another temple that would come that would bring life And it would bring God's blessings to the lowest places on earth. Isn't that a hope-filled vision? See, over the years, this prophecy has been interpreted in more ways than I can explain. But one of the ways that it has been interpreted is by seeing the river as the Holy Spirit moving through the church to be a source of life and blessing to every corner of the world. And I, I agree with that interpretation. When you see Jesus speak on the Feast of Tabernacles, he said that he stood at the temple courts and he cried out, anyone who believes in me, out of them will flow rivers of living water. And so also in Jerusalem is where the church started. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit went from Jerusalem to every part of the world. More on that later. And so the river is continually flowing in this vision to every dead part, bringing life every single place that it flows. And we know this is true 
in a way because the church is the temple of God. The Israelites are still dreaming of the day when there will be a third temple built in Jerusalem while Christians understand that we are the temple of God, the body of Christ that was resurrected on the third day. God's temple is no longer a physical building in one location, but the people of God scattered throughout the world. And so as we read the Bible, we see that the river of God's Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, and it has continued to be poured out for the last 2,000 years into every low place on earth. Now, pastors, as pastors and missionaries, we have been to the most remote remote parts of this this earth and i'm telling you the river of god's holy spirit is in the jungles of indonesia the river of god's holy spirit is in the most remote islands in the philippines the river of god's holy spirit is in the little villages of el salvador and guatemala we've seen it with our very eyes in 1998 our church was at a crossroads we were growing really fast, and, and we had a choice to make. Should we, should we relocate and, and buy a larger property with more than 38 parking spots and, and seek to become one of the fastest, largest mega churches in the Long Beach area, or would we stay here and cap our growth? It would make most sense to purchase the Walmart around the corner, right? And to build a big castle and to be the biggest it church around town with ample parking lot. Wouldn't that have been amazing? This is, in the eyes of what most church growth experts were telling pastors at the time, that's how you build a large and influential church. That is the way to go. Get lots of parking and lots of seats so that everyone can come to your church. And so Pastors Larry and Deb did what good leaders do. They bought the Walmart. I'm just kidding. They did not buy the Walmart. They went away to pray for a week. They hit the stop button and said, let's go see what God wants for us. Let's not go with trends and let's not go with what the people say. Let's see what God wants for us. And as they read God's word, the Lord gave them a revelation called a river church from Ezekiel chapter 47. And instead of becoming a lake church where people float into one place around one pastor and kept everybody who comes in a river church, people would flow into light and life and flow out to start new churches. And since 1998, we began making intentional efforts at starting new churches, and this is what makes our church so unique. It's so unique that only 7% of churches in America have ever intentionally started other churches that start other churches. And fewer than that do it more than once. A lot of churches plant other churches because they just don't like the pastor, right? They're like, we don't like Pastor Larry. We're going to go with Pastor Barry, right? Go start our church around the corner. So much multiplication in the kingdom happens through people not getting along. But what makes unique river churches is the intentional multiplication of disciples that leads to the multiplications of new churches. Our church is built to flow. Somebody say it with me, built to flow. And so Light and Life is designed to build out a river church that flows out disciples to plant new churches. But before we plant churches, we need to go fishing. Amen? How many of you here like fishing? I hate fishing. Okay, it's so boring. I fished in San Antonio, Texas, and all I caught was like baby catfish. It was terrible. My uncle would take me for five hours. This is before iPhones, folks, and internet. You didn't do anything. You just twiddled your thumbs and watched to see and hope that something bit your, your what do you even call it? Your, yeah, whatever that is. I don't like it. But listen, fish, fish are used in the Bible as a metaphor for unsaved people. And fishing is used as a metaphor for evangelism. And so if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, then you are called to go fishing for disciples. Without disciples, there's no church. 
Without disciples, there's no church. There's an ongoing joke among pastors that says, I, I would love church if it wasn't for the people. That's supposed to be funny, okay? Don't take it personal. <laughs> what, what we're trying to say is church is difficult to be part of a church, right? Because there's people involved, including me. But you can't have church without disciples. Matthew writes in chapter 4, about Jesus and how he got his ministry started. It says in verse 18, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, this is another lake on the north end. The Dead Sea is on the south end. The Sea of Galilee is on the north end. It says he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. A Christian preacher named Anthony of Padua from the 12th century was so passionate about and talented at preaching the gospel that he literally, he literally went fishing for, for fish after the people in a town in Italy rejected his gospel. So he went to the town of Rimini, Italy, and he started preaching, and he was an eloquent preacher. And people were blowing him off. So you know what he did? He went to the, to the shore, and he started preaching to the fish. And it said that the fish, they put their heads out of the water, tons of them, to listen to his message. First of all, do fish even have ears? Somebody... <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they do have ears. I don't know how you hear underwater. They, you know, blah, 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 Jesus. Blah. But it's okay. This, I'm not saying, hold on. I'm not saying this story is true, okay? It's part of like Christian church lore, okay? But the fish, tons of them got, got, got saved apparently. And I don't, I don't know how a fish gets saved, but in Spanish, pescado sounds like pecado, which is sin. So I don't know. Maybe there's something to it. So the people were watching, and they got jealous. They were so impressed by the move of these fish of the Lord and these hearts of these fish that they began to repent of their sin, and they put their faith in Jesus. Look up the story. Anthony, St. Anthony of Padua. There's icons with him preaching to the fish. Well, I'm not telling you to go and fish to go preach at fish, okay? Um, although someone did ask me, are, isn't all creation supposed to hear the good news? I don't know how to answer that, but we do have to share the gospel in order to make new disciples. Ezekiel describes a vision of a flowing river that creates such a rich environment that it attracts swarms of fish. The environment is so attractive that it attracts swarms of fish. And as spirit-filled disciples, we are called to do the same. How can I therefore take a step in fishing for people. First of all, I think we need to create an attractive environment. An attractive environment. People should be so attracted by the way you think, you talk, and you live that it creates such a positive, life-giving environment that it attracts the lost fish around you. Rather than the opposite. People should not be repelled by you, by what you say, by how you post on Facebook. They shouldn't see all the secondary stuff. Instead, see so much Jesus in your life that they say, I want what he's having. Right. Also, you need to identify your fishing spot. I, I think Pastor Sean f does fly fishing. What's your fishing spot, Pastor Sean? Where is it? Not gonna, okay, man. <laughs> Can you take me and redeem my fish? Okay, thank you. Identify your fishing spot. Verse 10 says, fishermen will stand along the shore from En Gedi to En Eglame, and there will be places for spreading nets. And so God has uniquely placed you among your people, your family, your neighborhood, your coworkers, your classmates, your gym workout people in order for you to cast your net. So identify your fishing spot. And number three, Get yourself a fishing net. Get yourself a fishing net. You don't need to go to Big Five Sporting Goods, okay, to find one. But you also can't fish with your bare hands. You're not a grizzly bear. You can't fish with your bare hands. Get yourself a simple evangelism tool. Start by knowing the story that God has redeemed and is redeeming in your life. One of the simplest ways we teach people how to share their story is by writing down, I once was... But now I'm. And in the middle, how did you meet Jesus? Or how did he meet you? 
Man, I once was a drunkard, a liar, a thief, a cheater, but then I met Jesus, and he's changed my life, and now I am becoming these things. You can continue to grow in your skills and knowledge of God and the gospel, but you don't need a master's degree to go fish for people. You don't need to know Greek to go fish for people. Let's start by creating an attractive environment, recognizing that there's so many fish that are ready to be caught. Identify your fishing spot and start casting your net. Amen? Good discipleship can lead to rivers of churches. The first church in Europe was started by the Holy Spirit, a few preachers, and some praying women by a river. Did you know that? Go read the book of Acts. It says that Paul came to the town of Philippi because he saw a vision that led him there, a vision of a man saying, come, come over here, come on. So they went to Philippi, and it says that they went to go look for people of the, uh, of the Jewish people, and they found some women praying by the river. Can we get a shout-out to the ladies in the house? Yeah. Look, y'all planted the first church in Europe that changed the whole world. That's incredible. Holy Spirit, a couple preachers, and some praying women by the river. And since then, hundreds of thousands of churches have been planted over the last 2,000 years in Europe and from Europe to the rest of the world. Churches can be started when disciples are made and they band together to form a new gospel communities. But there are a few more steps of intentional design that our house needs to have in order to really truly be a river church. You don't just become a river church overnight or, or by mistake. But there's a few things that we need to build into our design in order to continue to be a river church. Because you see, many churches do not become rivers of life, but dead seas. Many churches become dead seas. So let me start there. A church's stagnation can lead to death. You see, the dead sea is so salty that it cannot sustain life because of the salinity in the water, plants and fish and other aquatic life form Do not thrive in that setting. It is so salty that I even floated to the top, okay? It was a weird experience. There's literally mounds of salt that you can, people take pictures there uh, and, and all that stuff. People export the salt and the mud, but it is stagnant and it leads to death. A church that remains stagnant leads to death. A church or disciple that does not receive the flow of God's spirit and fails to release it outward becomes spiritually lifeless. And so without active discipleship or an outward movement of the church, churches become barren and unfruitful. But also a church's lack of outlet prevents growth. Just the Dead Sea, similarly, it has no outlet and that's why it's so salty. There's nothing flowing out of it. And when a disciple or churches only receive without giving, for example, hoarding God's blessings, failing to share the gospel, or neglecting mission, they become stagnant. Spiritual health requires both receiving from God and pouring out to others. And lastly, a church's isolation can breed barrenness. The Dead Sea is an, is an ecosystem that is isolated from all the other ecosystems. And when you become a church that is isolated from other churches and from communities and from a missional vision and from collaborating with other like-minded folks, you become barren and a dead wasteland. And you start overcharging people to swim in your waters. So how do we continue to become a river church and avoid becoming a dead sea? A river church requires spirit-filled vision, new leaders, and sending. A river church requires spirit-filled vision, new leaders, and sending. In a river church, everyone embraces a multiplication vision. And as members of this church, every person must adopt the vision that God gave to Ezekiel and allow God's messengers to lead us so far into the river that we become carried down river. We can't just dip our toes. We can't just remain ankle deep. We can't even remain just... Uh, waist deep, we need to jump fully into the river vision of God. 
And I believe, and Pastors Larry and Deb and Sean and I, we believe that this is not just a call for light and life, but it's a call for the worldwide church to continue to multiply, to stop hoarding resources and people, and to empower others so that they can flow to the lowest places on earth. And so that was the first thing we needed, everyone embracing a multiplication vision. So how are you embracing this multiplication vision that God has given us? Number two, we need intentional leadership development. At Light and Life, it is rare that we will recruit outsiders to come and lead with us. Pastor Daniel, you're the exception because you're my friend, okay? I've known you for 10 years. Um, we have been called instead to raise up our own leaders from within, but also to develop untapped potential in people that are overlooked in other settings. And God has done that time and time again. And, and we believe that many more leaders and pastors are sitting in these seats right now and have yet to come through our doors as well as visitors. You see, at Light and Life, we've seen a convicted killer a milk salesman, a pharmacy technician, a car insurance broker, a janitor, a truck driver, a city employee, a rental car rep, a Boeing employee, a failed nursing student, Pastor Deb, shout out to you, and so many more become pastors and leaders and church planters. Hey, she says she quit nursing at APU, okay? She, and she's proud of it. The first dropout out of the nursing program. And look at how many people have been healed through her ministry. Come on, people. Just to clarify, none of us are the convicted killer, okay? Just saying. <laughs> that's, that's up the street, all right? Uh, Funny enough, today, Chapel of Change is ordaining one of the women that got baptized in our church 14 years ago. Today, she's being ordained as an elder in Chapel of Change. Praise God. That's what he does when we develop, intentionally develop leaders. Amen? The third part of this, to continue to become a river church, we, we need to be committed to organizing and sending new gospel communities to dead places. New gospel communities to dead places. We prioritize identifying and sending disciples to start new church communities so, so that the spiritually dead, dry, and isolated places in our community, in our state, in our nation, and around the world, both locally and globally, are are feeding, are receiving a gospel that brings life everywhere they go. And so my question is, might, might God be stirring you to make disciples? Might God be stirring you to help plant a new church? Our hope is that God would be doing both now and until he returns or until he calls us home. Amen? A few years ago, I opened up Google Maps and I looked for every church that was listed in the map for the city of Long Beach, and I even threw in their Signal Hill, okay? And can you guess how many churches I found for a population of almost half a million people? 225 churches for half a million people. Many of us might, might have the mentality that there's too many churches, I see one on every corner. There's too many churches. We don't need another church. But if you divided, I don't do the math well, but I asked Google to help me. If you divided half a million by 250, you would have to put 2,000 people in every single one of those 225 churches in order to fully reach the area of Long Beach and Signal Hill. What I'm saying is that we do not have nearly enough churches to effectively reach this city. Now imagine every country, state, county, town, and island in the entire world from the Amazon to Arabia. We need more churches. Verse 9, the key verse says, where the river flows, everything will live. You see, God is using our church to spread life all around the country and all around the world because we refused to become a lake and instead we became a river by God's grace and God's mercy. 
You see, you may not see Pastors Deb and Larry most Sundays of the year, but that's because they have the unique ministry to do the work of apostles, empowering and teaching others to become a river church like Light and Life did in 1998. And, and while you may not see them at church, many people are seeing our story through their ministry. Even some churches taking our name is like, what? You became a light in life? All right, that's awesome. Or you took our mission statement? Praise God, it's from the Bible. Enjoy it. We don't care as long as more people are gaining the river vision. So our church is inspiring hundreds of leaders every year to commit themselves to making disciples and to planting churches. And because of your generosity, because of your prayers, because of how you have contributed, every month we also host more than 30 or 40 church planners in our church campus that are going to plant churches. Every month that happens. So... So I, I end with this question. Why, why will Light and Life continue to plant churches? Because we want to be faithful to the biblical command, which says go fruitful and multiply. Jesus says, I am building my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. He made disciples and he planted the church and we want to be faithful to the biblical command, but also because we want to be true to the great commission, the commission. He gave us a mission not to sit on our hands and attend church once a week and give God one hour, but to give him everything that we've got and to go make disciples of every nation, every tongue, and every tribe until people from every one of those believes in Jesus, but also because we want to bring God as much glory as possible. In Ephesians, Paul writes, to God be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ. And so there's much glory for God to receive as we multiply churches and spread the gospel about the earth. And so what can we do as we stand to our feet and reflect in our hearts, what can I do, Pastor Joel? I'm not called to be a pastor. I'm not saying that that's a reality, but surely there's a handful of you in this church that will be called to enter one of the most unique jobs in the whole history of the world. But for all of us remains a mission. The first is this, swim it, swim in the river. Go all in. Like Ezekiel, who was led to the river until he was swimming in it, jump in. Let's go. Don't dip your toes. Don't stay ankle deep. Don't stay knee deep. Don't stay waist deep. Don't stay shoulder deep. Jump in the river and let's swim. Jesus is coming soon. And we only have one life to live. Our friends, our family members that we're so kind to and never share the gospel with, they have either a destiny to be with God for the rest of their lives or apart from him for eternity. Let us not waste time. But let us jump into the river and share the gospel. And secondly, cast your net. Let's go fish for some disciples. Let's shift the culture in our families. Let's not just talk about the Rams. Let's talk about Jesus Christ. Let's ask them the deep question, how is your soul? How can I pray for you? And do you know Jesus Christ? Cast your net on the banks of the river and watch God fill your nets till they are ripping. Because where the river flows, everything will live. Where the river flows, everything will live. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? If you sense the Lord just touch your heart to be committed or recommitted to making disciples with me, would you raise your hand right now as I pray for God to do this by his spirit to help us remain committed to this call? God, you see our hands, you know us, you know our hearts, and you know whether we are making disciples or not, Jesus. And we want to be like the sower, Lord God, that planted so many seeds that, that we had 30, 50, 100 fold in return, Jesus. We want to be found to be faithful and fruitful. Now, it, this one is a strange question, but if you felt like God may be calling you to help plant a church one day, this may be just for one or two people, would you just raise your hand? I want to pray for you that you would hold all things loosely. God, 
We pray for those who may feel one day the call to flow down river, to help start a new gospel community, whether here locally or somewhere on the earth, Lord God. We know that you, the workers are few and you are calling many people to devote themselves to the planting of new churches. And now would you open your hands as I bless you with a prayer from Ephesians chapter three, a prayer of Paul, perhaps the greatest church planter and disciple maker that ever lived outside of Jesus. And he writes this. He says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than you ask or imagine according to his power that it is now at work in us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And the people of God said, amen. Can we give God some praise and some thanks and some glory this morning? Friends, you, you belong in the River Church. And we don't make up the River Church. I don't make it up. Larry doesn't make it. Sean, we together are part of that River Church. I'd love to bless you. Would you open up your hands? I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that you would go to swim in the river and cast your nets for his glory. Go in his grace and peace and have a great Thanksgiving week. God bless.